Human Organizational Performance, and it's presented by Ben Ferguson. Ben is the Corporate Human and Organizational Performance Director for Cargill, with responsibility for leading the process of integrating human organizational performance, thinking and methods into the operations within the Cargill organization. Ben has been uh, has more than 14 years of experience training, coaching, and integrating HOP into industrial organizations. Prior to joining Cargill in 2017, Ben had HOP and environmental health and safety roles with the HECO companies, John Deere and Alcoa. In addition to human organizational performance, Ben's expertise in industrial emergency response incident investigation and event analysis. He's a graduate of Purdue University with a degree in industrial hygiene and holds the certified safety professional credential. Let's give a big convey welcome to Ben Ferguson. Thanks Mark, appreciate it. So I promise you I am the same person that you saw in the photo. This is post-pandemic or current pandemic's phase Ben. It looks a little bit different. So, so my name's Ben, I'm a safety professional. Oh, nobody's, <laughs> nobody's gonna bite that one? Okay. So um, for this conversation we're gonna have over the next hour, uh, I can't give you all of the information we would normally give to make you an expert or make you fully fluent in, in HOP. I can give you, what I can give you is an introduction to a few of the ideas. Does that sound fair? Is that all right? Because otherwise we'd be talking the whole rest of the day and, and part of tomorrow and, and I don't want to chew up all the time. But we'll give you a, a quick introduction uh, and a little bit of the ways that we're using some of the ideas related to human and organizational performance. Fair warning, there is some amount of audience participation in this presentation. But it usually comes in the form of raising your hand. So we're not gonna do group falls, we're not gonna do singing or karaoke contests or anything like that. So for those people that aren't into that kind of thing, relax, it's gonna be okay. For those people that are into that kind of thing, I don't know what to do with you, so we'll figure it out as a team, okay? And it's okay to laugh at my jokes, I promise. So from a Cargill perspective, uh, our journey, our relationship with HOP started from a perspective of being dissatisfied, wholly dissatisfied with our fatality and serious injury performance. So over the years, when we look back at our data, we could see that we worked hard for our overall injury performance to meet industry standards and then to begin to exceed industry standards to have rates that were lower than average for our kinds of industry, but our fatality and serious injury performance wasn't having the same change. So we started to benchmark other organizations, go out to look at other peer companies and understand what they were doing in their work to reduce serious injuries and fatalities and learn from those kinds of events differently. And what Cargill found was human and organizational performance or HOP. So just show of hands, who has heard of HOP before, heard people use the term, have some familiarity with it? And how many people are hearing about it for the first time? Oh man, this is a much easier road to plow when people don't uh, know about it. I can tell you kind of anything, right? Yeah. Only kidding, only kidding. So I got some people in the room that'll check my science and make sure I'm doing okay. So we started, integrating and learning about HOP as a way to improve our performance as an organization related to serious injuries and fatalities. That's, that's our primary focus. We found some other benefits, but we're gonna talk about it from that perspective for our discussion today. So, when I introduce HOP and when we start thinking about it, we use this diagram, we call this our systems model to kind of explain what our focus is. And if I had to explain HOP in like an elevator speech, if I had 15 seconds of your time, I would say that human and organizational performance is about understanding the way that human beings 
interrelate or connect with the systems that they operate in and how that relationship between people and the systems can create success or can create failure. And about learning from those opportunities, learning about how people and systems work together. So we use this model as a way to illustrate that idea, to become a bit of a construct, a way for us to think about it. So we understand HOP as the relationship between the people we work with, the people in our organization, the programs we use to direct and guide our work that set our expectations and our limits, the processes that we use to complete our work, the methods that we use to add value to our products, the work environment that we create and maintain. So this is both the physical work environment, so where our facilities are located, what kind of temperatures we deal with from a human perspective or a process perspective. Is it loud? Is it slippery surfaces? But it's also the social environment. How do people interrelate with each other? How open are we as an organization to communication? The organization, how we're structured, who makes what kinds of decisions, who sets the values for the organization, who makes the decisions on priorities and budgets, and our equipment, the physical assets that we operate, the physical assets that we use to do the work that we need to do. So we understand these elements as being interrelated, meaning that when there's a variability or some turbulence or a change in one of these elements, it'll affect the others. For example, if I have an equipment malfunction, I know that's gonna affect the processes that support that equipment. So I lose a pump, a motor, a blower, I know that's gonna have a process impact. But that equipment malfunction could also affect the people, because now I have to engage people to do different kinds of work. Maybe work that was unplanned. Work that's a surprise. This equipment malfunction may be related to how we planned and how we set up our organization. How we budgeted for continuous maintenance or uh, preventative maintenance or inspections. So when I see a variability in one element of these systems, it affects all of them. And we've been through some of this variability. We know we've had a big change in how our people had to work, working through the pandemic and dealing with all the things that our people had to do. Changes in our work environment, things we had to do differently because of the, the pandemic. So we, we know this as an experience. So this gives us some, com, a construct to understand this. So when there's a change in one part of the system, it affects the other parts of this system. In the middle of the system, we have this individual, this person. We think of this person as the, the people with their hands on the controls, operators, technicians, people are, are, that are there being the last point of contact before the product goes out the door. We recognize that these people, this individual is part of the system. The system is not complete without that individual. So when there's a change in the system, it affects the other parts of the system, but it also affects this individual. So if we restructure our organization, we change our people, we have a new program, our processes have an upset, it's gonna affect that operator, that technician, the person with their hands on the controls. And then the opposite is true. When this person's having a bad day, has anybody ever had a bad day? Really, only three, four? Okay, the few over here have had bad days. Are you having one now? Oh, that's good to hear, thanks. When this person has a problem or an issue, when they're tired or fatigued, or they're really run out of their capacity to operate, it changes the way the system functions. So, we'll do a little bit of a survey. By a show of hands, how many of you believe that most of your employees have the intention of coming to work every day to do safe and high quality work? Fair enough, okay. How many of you believe that the way somebody shows up to work can affect their ability to do safe and high quality work, whether they're fatigued or injured, tired or ill? Yeah, that's what this idea is about. So this individual becomes an important part of this system. They complete the system. The system doesn't operate with that individual. What this person brings 
is a very unique skill set that is very difficult to replicate. They bring in something called adaptive capacity. This ability to adjust for changes in the system, little changes and big changes happening around them, this person is there to optimize the system, to make the little adjustments to the equipment or to the process to give us the best outcome. And this is normally successful. This is how good work happens every day. And it's really not until usually we exceed the capacity of this individual that we experience some kind of problem. Okay so far? Making sense? Okay. So, the systems model helps us understand the complex systems we work in every day. Sorry. As human beings, the way that our brains are wired, our brains are kind of wired to be lazy. The political word for that is efficient, but technically it's lazy. It's the least amount of effort for the most amount of output, right? Our brains simplify the world around us. And here's a way to think about that. Think about your commute from your home to the facility or office that you go to every day. That normal commute from A to B, from home to work or from work to home. How many people that would say that is a very simple task, that you can do it with your eyes closed? Or you have the experience of remembering getting in your car in the morning and getting out of the car at the plant or the office, but have no memory of the journey in between. Anybody have that experience? I mean, it must have gone well because here you are, but no conscious memory of what happened. So would you say that's a simple task or a complex task? Simple? Yeah, most of us would see it as simple. It's so simple our brains aren't even really registering consciously what we're doing most of the time. Think about how many individual decisions have to be made correctly for you to be able to travel from your house to the facility or to the office you're going to work at. How many different individual decisions by you, by your fellow travelers, in this amazingly complex and fragile system we call the US transportation grid, where we all agree to this administrative control that a red light means stop most of the time, and a red sign with the eight sides that says stop means, man, this is a really long pause. But yeah, it means stop. We all agree to that. All of the things that have to go well. We really operate in a lot of complex systems. This model helps us have a place to start understanding some of that complexity, to begin to digest that, to look at the parts that cause us, can cause us problems. We talked about changes or deficiencies in one part of the system can affect the other parts of the system. So when there's variation, when there's turbulence, it isn't isolated to just that part of the system. It will affect others. Our employees are experts at adapting to changes and optimizing our systems. That adaptive capacity happens through their expertise. If we really want to understand how our systems are functioning, these are the people to engage with. Not necessarily the people that design the system, but the people that live with that system every day. They have to know the little things, the way that you jiggle the plug on the pump to make it run right, or you put the chewing gum on the side of the vent so it doesn't rattle all day and drive you crazy. That kind of adaptive capacity. And the, the quote that comes very useful in thinking about systems thinking that I, I like a lot is that a bad system will be a, a good person every time that the system has a lot of power and the human being is the losing side of this arm wrestling match every time. This comes from the world of quality, from a guy called W. Edwards Deming. Are you familiar with Deming? Heard of Deming before? Anybody ever heard of Deming? Deming principles, Deming theory. It may not be as popular now, but if you've worked with Toyota production system, Six Sigma, Lean Six Sigma, those kinds of technologies are all derivative of the work that Deming did. And he's really one of the foundational thinkers for systems understanding. Okay, still good? Too fast, too slow? Had a lot of coffee this morning, so I'm not sure. 
All right. We talked about complexity. And one of the opportunities we have with this systems understanding is to get an understanding about how work really happens. And what we're talking about is this difference between what we think we're going to do and what we actually have to do. When we put together our work plan, when we set up our systems, we believe that it's going to be a fairly linear process. We're going to do step one, and then step two, and then step three, and step four. If we follow this process, we'll get to success. Does that sound about right? That's how we put our plans together? Has anybody ever had a day that's gone strictly to plan? Anybody ever had that day? Oh, sorry, anybody ever had that day at work where it's gone strictly to plan? No, most of us haven't. The reality of work is often very different. It's much more dynamic. We have to zig and zag in order to get to success. And sometimes success it is, isn't even in the same place we thought it was going to be. That's the kind of adaptive capacity that our people bring to the system. So for us, what becomes really interesting is learning about what we had to do to be successful. What our operators and technicians, our employees and teammates with the hands on, their, on the controls have to do in order to get our products out the door. That's some of the learning we get to have. So we've talked a little bit about human error earlier in today. And some parts of HOP are understanding human error, how human error occurs, what are the drivers for human error. <coughs> so if we're going to talk about human error, we have to start from a pretty solid definition of what an error is, or what a human error is. And this is kind of the standard textbook definition. So an error is an action or inaction that unintentionally, and the, the very key word in this definition, unintentional, the consequences of this action or inaction are unintentional. That action or inaction can unintentionally result in an undesirable or unwanted condition. Or it could lead a task or system outside of its limits, or it can deviate from a rule, standard, or expectation. So when we have an undesirable or unwanted condition, that's a bit easy to detect. That causes us some pain. That's a product we have to remake, something we have to clean up, an injury that has occurred, something that's painful. These other two situations, going outside of a, a limit or deviating from a rule, standard, or expectation, these may not have very much of a consequence. So sometimes we can make a mistake or we can have an error with very little consequence. And we'll talk about what that looks like. Why is error so interesting? It's because of the studies that have come out about error over the last decade or so. That when we look at all the workplace injuries, about 20% are related to machine and equipment failure, but the bulk of the workplace injuries are related to human error. So that's why it becomes interesting. If you dig into this a little bit deeper, you look at some of the drivers for human error, about 30% of the drivers for human error come from individual mistakes isolated to the person, and about 70% are related to something related to the organization, something related to the systems that the organization creates. So here's the challenge that, that folks like me get to, uh, get to enjoy. We tell leaders of the organization, 80% of our problems are caused by human errors. So they all nod their head, yeah, that makes sense. And we tell them that's mostly driven by the decisions that you make and the systems you create. They're like, no way, that can't be true. So it takes a little while to get people comfortable with this idea. Sometimes you have to provide some examples some ideas that help them understand what we're talking about. One of those ideas is this exercise. Oh, sorry. All right, so this is an exercise we're gonna do together. What we're gonna do, and if you've seen this exercise, kind of keep the secret of this exercise to yourself, okay? But what we're gonna do as a team is we're gonna look at a sentence on this screen. I'm gonna advance the slide and one sentence will pop up in this blue box. 
your mission is very, very simple. Your mission is to count the number of times the letter F shows up in this area and only in that area. It does not matter if it's a capital F or a lowercase f, just the number of times that the letter F appears. Is that clear? It's really important we get this done right the first time. We cannot miss one letter F. But I have faith, you guys can do it, okay? But we also don't have all day to do this, so you got about seven and a half seconds to get this done. All right? Everybody ready? No objections? Go. Okay. So how many times did the letter F appear in the sentence? How many Fs? How many people got at least three? How many people got four? How many people got five? How many people got six? How many people got more than six? Okay, looks like about half of us got three, some got four. Here's the answer. What happened? Okay, so everybody that did not get the correct answer, just put your wallet on the table and walk out. <laughs> what happened? How, how could you guys miss this? Very simple exercise. What letter is F did you miss? The ofs. Why do, you, why do we think we missed the ofs? You're scanning? Right, you're scanning. Okay, of is a small word. It's one of those words that's joined two other ideas together in a sentence, and our brain slips quite past it. Scientific, we can hear it. Files, finished, obvious. When we say the word of, it's not an F sound. We don't say that uff. We say it of, like it's a V. So in our brain, it's a bit different. Did anybody consciously not count the letter F in the word of? But decide not to say, no, I don't want to count those. those. Those are not part of the mission. Right? Would you agree that if you miss the letter F in the word of, that it's an error? Yeah. Did I set you up? Yeah. And this is an exercise you can use. And I stole it from somebody else. It's not my idea. I'll be honest with you. This has been around for a while. You can only do it once. Here's the bad part. You can use it, but you can use it once with your audience, then your audience knows. So you gotta put that caveat in there. If you've seen this before, keep the secret to yourself. And it only also works for English as a first language learners. If I show this to someone who learned English as a second language, six right away. They can get it about three seconds. Because all they see is the letters. It's very different. But this helps illustrate that you know people aren't consciously trying to create some kind of bad outcome. It just kind of happens. So we start off with this definition about human error, that it's an action or an action that the consequences are unintentional. It could lead a task or system outside of its limits, could deviate from a rule, standard, or expectation, or could result in undesirable, unwanted condition. One of the things we understand is that humans are error-making machines. It's part of our core fallibility that people make errors all the time. We're constantly making errors. There is a statistic that, include, that we include some of our learnings that we borrowed from another group. How many errors per hour does an airline pilot make while they're operating the aircraft? Wheels up, off the ground, lives in their hands. How many errors per hour? Any guesses? Six to eight errors every hour. Two pilots in every aircraft, that's 12 to 16 errors that are happening every time you're in the air for every hour that you're in the air. How many people flew here? How many people are driving back? <laughs> so not all errors mean that something bad's gonna happen. But people make errors all the time. We wanna understand that an error is not a choice. You cannot choose to make an error. Just like I cannot choose to make a mistake, an error is an unintentional consequence. 
And many errors don't impact performance. That's how a pilot can make six to eight errors an hour, or 12 to 16 errors when you count both pilots in that cockpit. Not all errors result in con bad consequences. Often, our folks are experts at identifying that one of these errors that leads us outside of our limits or deviates from expectations has happened. They catch it early, they bring the system back into compliance. It's still an error, but it doesn't cause a problem. But there are situations where we don't want errors to mix with our performance, and that's what we've decided to focus on. That's where we're applying the concepts of HOP in our organization. Some challenges that we've faced that may sound familiar to you as well. An error is easy to detect in retrospect, meaning after an event has occurred, it's easy to look backwards and see who made the wrong decision. But they're very difficult to detect in context. So while people are making their decisions, they believe their decisions are correct. They believe their decision is the right decision, otherwise they wouldn't be moving forward with it. So that brings us to this interesting paradox Human beings are fallible, we make mistakes, we make errors frequently, but we're also very optimistic because we believe our decisions are the correct ones. And as humans, in the societies we live in now, when we talk about especially big events, we have this kind of natural bias that sees an, someone making an error as a kind of internal failure, a character flaw, or a moral failing. Kind of equating error like it's a sin. And this balance, this, this idea, this, this bias is a bit challenging to overcome sometimes. And the real impact of this is that it impacts the way that we learn when we have an event. Because if you think someone's a bad person, that colors the way you see the situations. It colors the way that you see all of the outcomes. And it can erode trust. That means that people will be less willing to share with us information about the systems that they operate, about the reality of the work, the squiggly line that they navigate every day. So, with that understanding, our mission becomes building and maintaining a system that can both tolerate and recover from the errors that people will make. It's assuming that people will be fallible, that imperfections will occur because it's human beings and systems working together. It becomes a bit of a different design idea. Try to make it easy to do the right thing and harder to do the wrong thing. Try to set the path of least resistance to doing the right thing first. We look for situations where an error could lead to life-altering or life-ending events. So we take this idea of systems thinking and our understanding of, of error likeliness and the situations that could provoke errors. We will look at the kinds of work that our people and our contractors engage in that if we get it wrong, our ability to recover is not very high. And the consequences of that mistake, the consequences of that error could severely alter someone's life or end someone's life. So we can focus it on, on a broad category of work, but we get real intense about looking at specific categories of work where people are working with very dangerous things. And we value and increase the value of near misses. Near misses are such great learning opportunities. They are truly gifts. And when we have a near miss, it gives us the opportunity to do some analysis, to learn about what went well with our system's response? When we had this near miss, what parts of our systems responded well? Whether it was a, a, a ground fault circuit interrupter system, or a fall restraint in how it's designed, our chemical overflows, our flow detection, when we're supposed to have the system isolated, how well did those things work? It also gives us a chance to ask this question. Uh, and this question's a bit profound. Were we lucky that this was a near miss, or were we good? So were we fortunate, meaning that had one or two things gone a little bit differently, 
we wouldn't be having a near-miss investigation, we'd be having a SIF investigation? Or were we good that this is the worst outcome that could happen based on how we designed this system? And this is a kind of a difficult mirror to have folks look back on themselves, especially from a near-miss, especially when the consequence is minor, or it's maybe a little bit inconvenient. So it takes some effort to create this value. But asking this question, are we lucky or are we good? If we find out that we're good, it's something we want to celebrate. Yes, it's not great that we had a near miss, but we had only a near miss because of what we invested in our systems and our systems response and the inspection of those systems and the time and effort that we make sure those systems are present and useful to us. So you got something to celebrate instead of something to uh, kind of hang your head about. Okay so far? How am I on time? Half an hour, oh no. I'm just kidding. It's okay, Mark, relax, okay. Okay, so I said before that we focus our efforts about looking for error likely situations and these ideas on some specific categories of work. Within Cargill, we have these 12 lifesaver activities, these activities that where we've defined where we know we have different risk potential where we know that our risk is elevated when we engage in this kinds of work, like hot work, or working in confined spaces, working with bulk materials, rail car loading, lockout, tagout, powered industrial equipment. And when we apply our hop thinking or our methods to these ideas, then we start digging into where do we have some systemic drivers and weaknesses? Where do we have single point vulnerabilities? A single point vulnerability means if one thing changes, the whole system fails. So if somebody makes a mistake, one person doesn't do exactly the right thing, then we have a SIF event, or we're very likely to have a SIF event. Then we start looking for the presence and the capacity of the controls that keep us safe. And we ask some kind of specific questions. And they kind of mirror what the panel discussions earlier this morning said. We go into the process, what could kill us, what could harm us? What keeps us safe? And is that enough? Does that system have enough capacity for the work we're doing today? Is it there, is it present, is it viable, and is it enough? Is our fall protection system, does it work with this type of rail car? Or does it work for this kind of work? Do we have the right expertise to go into this confined space and if something bad happens, to get the people back out? So we start testing and probing in these areas to see where we have weaknesses and vulnerability and applying the idea of what could happen. And then we engage in those activities as work is happening to learn from the work as it occurs. We have an observation process specifically focused on these 12 items where we go out and verify and learn from the work that it's occurring so that we can understand how well are we supporting our people or our, our contractors, the people we invite in to use their expertise to do this work, how well are we supporting them? How is the system from their perspective functioning? So we can apply the idea of hop in a lot of places, but this is our intended focus. This is where we spend the most of our, our time and effort. We elevate these because we want them to have, we want them to compete for attention, time, and resource. We have a set of guiding principles. Most of the folks that, that work in this space have these principles, and I'll share ours real briefly with you so you have an idea of some of the construct. First, we, we want people to understand that everybody makes mistakes. It's part of being human. We call those errors. But sometimes even our best people will make mistakes. Sometimes our best people make the biggest mistakes. Why do you think that happens? Why is it sometimes our best people will make our biggest mistakes? You can get relaxed, yeah. It could be a little bit of complacency. Who do you give your biggest problems to? Your top performers or your bottom performers? Your 
usually you throw your biggest problems at your top performers. So your top performers can be put into a system that they don't understand how it functions, or they don't have the experience. They get involved in these new and novel situations. So they have a higher potential to make a mistake. So whether you're a top performer, bottom performer, somebody in the middle, everybody makes mistakes. It's part of being human. I can't really eliminate that capacity from people. What I have influence on are the situations I put people in. So the situations that drive errors, the situations that it create a condition where someone's more likely to make a mistake are something we can learn about. They have traits. They have characteristics. They have statistics and research and study behind them that tells us that in this situation, this is more likely to happen to someone. So that's what we learn about. That's the capacity we invest in. And we use that learning and apply it to when we have to do that high-risk work to look for if our controls are adequate. Your organization influences the behavior of the people within it. This is true for all organizations. Another way to think about this is that, that context drives behavior. The organization creates a context a physical context and a social context about how work happens. The people that have the most influence on how people are gonna decide are the people that you work closest with, your peers and your supervisor. And that's true for that operator in the middle of that systems model. So if we're not happy with the work that's happening, the way that the behavior is being expressed, the way that people are making decisions, our opportunity then is to shift this context a little bit, to shift what's being reinforced, to shift what's being rewarded. Positive reinforcement builds trust. Do people do things right more often or wrong more often? Yeah, right, okay. Sometimes these long pauses are a little scary. People do things right more often than they do wrong. When we recognize people for successful work, when we recognize people for using the established process, using the methods and tools that are specified, especially if that took extra work or effort, or somebody could have used a shortcut and they didn't, that positive recognition reinforces that value, reinforces that process honoring behavior. And it makes it more likely that person is going to repeat that behavior again. But it also, helps us earn the trust of that individual, recognizing that when leaders, whether they're formal leaders or informal leaders, come out to engage with them, that they're not only showing, they're not only showing up when a failure occurs. Because when you only show up when a failure occurs, everybody kind of associates you with failure. Kind of the way when a police officer pulls you over on a highway, you kind of always associate that with kind of a, a difficult social interaction followed by a difficult financial interaction. Speaking for a friend. So when we're there reinforcing the things that people do right, they're more likely to repeat them, and that helps us earn trust. That helps them, that trust helps us when it's time to learn from an event. It has a direct impact. So the more people trust us, the more details we get about the messy parts of the system, the stuff that doesn't go to plan, where they have to deviate from normal in order to get good work done. So that messy blue line that we, we saw earlier. So the return on investment of that trust that we build helps us learn better, helps us learn about what the reality of work that we've created is. When we see deviations, when we see someone acting outside of what we expect, it is rarely a malicious act meaning that people are rarely doing that to be a bad actor or cause a problem. What's normally happening is that is how that person has to adapt, that the system has put them in a place or created a condition that their only option to create success was that deviation, was to do something other than what was expected. So when you see a deviation that way, it kind of changes your focus. And what you want to see when you, when you see someone deviate, you get really interested in why is that necessary? 
what is it about my system? What is it about our organization? What is it about the way that we influence behavior that makes this the way that we have to do work? And this last one, leadership response matters. How a leader responds to bad news, how a leader responds to things like deviations and in, in events, directly impacts the kind of influence we have in our organization, whether we are building or eroding trust, how well we will learn from that event. So when we respond, when somebody calls us up with bad news, we want to think about the way that we're going to react to it. Because it could impact the way, the kind of information that we get back to us. Think about, are we building or eroding trust? How is the way that I'm asking my questions and the tone of my voice impacting the kind of information my team's going to find? And that's challenging. When you get that call at 2 o'clock in the morning, you're not really thinking in your active brain. That takes practice. All right. Last little bit, some ideas to take home. Some kind of key ideas or little nuggets that are kind of useful. This first idea comes from uh, one of the thought leaders in this space in human organizational performance. It's that people do what they do at the time that they do it for reasons that make sense to them at that time. So that's, in English, kind of a complex idea to express, not a very simple sentence. But what it's saying is that people make the decisions they make based on the context around them. And their understanding of their context and the objectives or the mission they want to achieve. So if we can't make sense of someone's decision, if we do not understand why someone would make that decision, it's very likely we do not understand the context. Sorry, I keep hitting the mic. My apologies. So if we don't understand that context, we have an opportunity to learn. There's something else we need to know. And we can't manage what we do not understand. And less information is not going to make us smarter. This is something, again, you have to practice it. It takes a little bit of time to come from problems, come from someone's deviation from the mindset of that people do what they do at the time. They do it for reasons that make sense to them at that time. If you practice it enough, it comes out a lot faster, I promise. You do sound like an auctioneer sometimes. But it, that helps us focus on, all right, so what had to be true for this decision to make sense to that person? It really kind of wants you to put yourself in that person's shoes, to see the system from their perspective. Has anybody ever made a decision that at the moment you were making it, that decision was the best decision you could have made? And about 18 months, two years, five years later, you would give anything in the world to go back in time and undo that decision. Anybody be, ever been in that place? You don't have to share, it's okay, but we've all been in that place. At the time you were making that decision, it seemed like the best decision with the information that was available to you and the objectives you wanted to create. Sometimes, as leaders, we have the benefit of hindsight. We know the outcome of what happened. We want to kind of get in the middle of the system with that individual and learn from their perspective. So this helps kind of create some of that systemic mindset, the learning from context. This next idea comes from another thought leader called Todd Conklin. Todd's one of the more popular current leaders, uh, and we'll talk about Todd again at the end. Um, but Todd's idea here is that we can either learn and improve or we can blame and punish. We will not be successful at doing both. So another way that he phrases it is that blame fixes nothing. That blame doesn't help us get better. It doesn't fix the gaps that we find in our systems. It doesn't create a situation where that same event could not happen again later down the road. So learning and improving is a deliberate strategy. And that requires reinforcement and demonstration, meaning that we have to model that behavior. 
It's something that within our own organization, we co coach and reinforce quite a bit. And it may be a departure from your history. And that's, in our organization, um, something we still work with. We work with an organization that grew up being comfortable or starting to get comfortable with the idea of accountability and holding people responsible, holding people accountable. And the word accountability became synonymous or almost a substitution for discipline. To hold someone accountable meant like what level of discipline. That, and that's not necessarily the, the intention, but that can be the result. We want to say that learning and improving is a deliberate strategy. So well, where are we going to invest our effort? And how do we benefit from sending this person home or firing this person? We're not saying we remove individual accountability. In your organization, would it be fair to say that you are responsible for coming to work to do safe and high quality work every day? Is that your core responsibility? Is that fair? Yeah, and is that true of all of your colleagues and the people that work in your organization, that our organizations expect us as individuals and as leaders to do safe and high quality work every day? Yeah. So when I have a breakdown in my core responsibility to do that, that's on me. If I fail in my duties and responsibilities, but I want to remove that from the context of the system. I want to understand both at the same time. One of the ways you can look for some indicators of maybe some shallow thinking or some maybe over focus on just the individual and not the individual and the system are these counterfactual statements. Counterfactual statements may be true. They may be accurate. But they may not be helpful in learning about how we got to this place where this event could occur. Counterfactual statements start like, sound like employee failed to follow procedure, or SOP was not used as directed, or the team failed to recognize a risk hazard or, or condition. Have you ever seen one of these in an event report? Anybody have ever written one? I have a friend who's done that once or twice. I should have told you earlier, we kind of play by Vegas rules. What happens here stays here, except for the recording. If you don't want to talk about yourself, you say it, the phrase starts, I have a friend who. Yeah, so I have a friend who, in his event analysis career, used to use those phrases quite a bit. They're true, but it kind of takes that decision outside of the context. So when you hear those decisions, you can ask the question, well, why is that true? Why didn't we use the SOP? What was driving the system where the SOP isn't valuable or wasn't used in this instance? Was the SOP not used in this instance or is it just not used at all? Is it not used because the SOP can't be used, didn't fit this situation, is out of date, incorrect for our equipment, incorrect for this product? It kind of opens the door when you start digging into those questions. So when you hear these phrases, dig a little bit. Get under the skin of, of why these why these phrases were used. This last one is a little bit about how we reinforce and share. And it's a real simple one. It comes from uh, actually our learning partner, the organization or the, the, our leader that we, or our expert that we partnered with, a guy called Rob Fisher. And Rob's advice is to make one simple, small, three letter for three letter substitution in your vocabulary for the first 72 hours after you have an event. And that's to stop using the word why and change that word to how. Instead of saying, why did we have this event? Ask the question, how did we have this event? How did we get to the place where this could occur? So the words and language we use have an influence on the decisions that people make and the ways that people think. So that influence is something we can recognize. And this little shift has an impact. So when we shift our language using the word how, it influences the way people look at, looks at event and opens the door to some, different, some, some deeper, more impactful learning to dig into maybe some of the systemic issues or the organizational weaknesses 
that allowed this kind of outcome. If we ask why too early, it can kind of cut short some of that critical thinking. It can get people to the point where they're coming to conclusions prematurely, where they're coming to conclusions with limited data or based on assumptions, that they haven't fully vetted out. So not crazy complex, it's a simple substitution, and that one takes some practice too. But that substitution, instead of asking why did we have this occur, asking how did we get here, when you have to answer the question of how, it's a, it's a different way you have to answer that. Does that make sense? Everybody okay? All right. So if you want to learn more, first place I would, I would point you to start, catch up with this guy. This is Rob Fisher here. Uh, he has a, 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 a company that, that does this work. He is our partner with Cargill. Uh, so Fisher Improvement Technologies, his website's here, improvewithfit.com. On there you can learn about what his organization does, his background in this kind of science, where he comes from. There are short videos um, that he calls, what's the word, rob Servations. So a little bit of a pun. If you can stomach the puns, it's a really good website to go to. The little ways you can learn about some systemic thinking or some, some hop-focused learning there. So it's a good place to start. If you want some books, some text to read, if you're looking to kind of do some professional development, three books that I would recommend any day. The first one, uh, The Five Principles of Human Performance. This is by Todd Conklin. It's a small book. It reads very quickly. You can read it in a long afternoon or the course of a couple evenings. It's uh, designed to be a very good introduction with examples and anecdotes to help you think about some of these ideas related to HOMP. If that book goes well for you and you get interested in more, The Field Guide to Understanding Human Error by Sidney Decker is kind of the handbook that most of uh, the practitioners in my field or, or this uh, area of practice start with. It, it kind of takes a deeper step goes more into some of the psychological science and the practical apl applicability of these ideas in real world space. So Decker's background, he's a college professor in Australia. He's uh, Dutch by origin, um, but before he became a professor and worked in this space, he was an airline pilot for a number of years. So a commercial airline pilot. And if you get through that and you're still interested in more, or if you're having trouble sleeping, this last one, Managing the Risk of Organizational Accidents by James Reason. So this is kind of the college text, the graduate level text that um, set all of this in motion. So if you wanted like the deepest compendium, if you wanted to get into like the nuts and bolts and the, go back to the original studies for this science that started in the 1970s and 1980s, this is the book for it. It's very deep and very technical. It is not an easy read but it has all of the core information. Everything that became HOP was based on this original work. It condensed a lot of different fields of science into one place, but it is written at a technical level. It is like, it's like a chapter a day, and then you go back and read like the last five pages of the chapter, remember what you read the day before, like it's, it's one of those books, but very deep. If you're not into reading, Todd Conklin also has this, this podcast, the Pre-Accident Investigation Podcast. He's had it for a number of years. I don't know how many different episodes he's got, but it's hundreds of episodes. He tends to alternate between two different content styles. One week it's a 30-minute or 45-minute discussion with a practitioner or a facility leader, and another week it's like a five-minute anecdote, quick story, quick idea, and it goes back and forth. Some of the short podcasts, the, the five-minute ones, are really good for your teams when you can find them. There's a couple of really good ideas in there that are simply expressed and, and, and really approachable. Uh, Sidney Decker also has a YouTube channel where you can learn about some of the work he's doing currently with his students in different organizations around the world, applying some of these ideas. Some of them um, pertain a lot because it's Australia, so there's a lot of oil and gas involvement. 
um, and a unique one involving a supermarket in the UK, but um, so Decker has some material out there as well. And then if there's anything I can do to help, you, get, you got a question, a problem, an issue, a doubt, you want to go a little bit deeper, let me know. Shoot me an email or connect with me some other way. And uh, this is what we do. This is part of being part of organizations like this and share it. So with that, five minutes for questions. This is the easy part about the after lunch. I think you mentioned it, maybe explained it, but I missed it. Oh. There we go. Um, you might have, I know you mentioned it, and you might have gone into it, and I just missed it. But you talked about buy-in, you know, of employees, which, mm -hmm. you know, you just can't force them to do it. You got to get buy-in. But how do you get your facility managers? to buy in first, because if you don't get them to buy in, the rest is a waste. And yeah. they're so focused because of management. M management wants safety, but they want to make money. Sure. And so they're focused every minute on making money. How do you get them to buy in to a yeah. true safety so then you can get their employees to buy in? So it kind of depends on the situation. Some facilities come from uh, a burning platform position. So they have a problem, and sometimes it's a very specific safety problem. So some of our facilities, they decided to start implementing or engaging with HOP because they had a very significant event. And this is about how they, they used HOP as a way to say, we want our culture to be different, this is our mechanism to be different. So that was their, that, for those facilities, that was their buy-in. Other facilities um, take some convincing, some, uh, how would you say, some influence. Some of that influence is saying, hey, one of your competitors internally, one of your peers, another facility manager, started applying HOP and here's the results he's getting, and more specifically, all the attention he's getting for the good results he's getting or she's getting. So if you wanted some of that, here's an opportunity to do that. So it's a little kind of car salesmanship. So sometimes um, it's a different kind of business case. So we're talking specifically from a health and safety perspective, we apply these error reduction methods and these Systemic weakness focuses on critical safety application, but these same ideas we can also use in other applications like quality or productivity, because error reduction error is error reduction. It's all about what system you apply it to. So we start off with this investment to make our safety systems as robust as they can be, but that same way of thinking can also help us look for weaknesses in our quality system. And then we can kind of lay the groundwork. If we have a quality problem, what do we have to do? We've got to make more of that same product. Do we plan for that? Probably not. So that creates a system upset. That system upset creates more risk, more exposure, more opportunity to have another problem. So if we can be safe, reliable, and have a repeatable process the first time, get it right the first time, if we have a system that helps us with that, then we get more efficient. If we work to plan, we have less unplanned downtime, we less, have less system upset. That becomes a pretty strong sales technique. And then we can use the data for unplanned downtime reduction, the data for SIF incidents or SIF near miss elimination. It all becomes part of, of how we convince someone to try it. Sometimes it happens that the whole facility is engaged, but the facility leader isn't. So they get some pressure from both sides because when there are skip level discussions that happen, you know, people are going to say, this guy's not on board. You don't want that kind of negative exposure, too. So there's a lot of social pressure we can use. One of the other problems I have is our management is at a stage on a percentage of the profit of the facility. Yeah. And the safety thing is right out of that box. Yeah. So the more safety or equipment safety that we integrate, the less safety. Mm. That's, so you, you have a system. I mean, that's a system-driven problem. You have a system that, that uh, puts a facility manager in a place where they got to decide which of those values is most important. And they make that decision actively every day because you have two systems and you have two objectives in conflict. I can make my system safe or I can have this extra bit of profit. 
And so they're, they're constantly trading back and forth. And sometimes we don't compete, especially if you have a track record of being lucky instead of good. Yeah. Fair enough. Thanks for your question. Probably, I didn't give you a silver bullet, but that wasn't what I was here selling. So. Okay. Thank you, Ben. Thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah, I'll be around. Yeah, rest of the day. Thanks.